Thanks so much, Emily. And I'm just thrilled to see how many people are joining this collaborative and the meeting today. A lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. And that just makes my heart sing because we want to grow the body of practice and grow the network of people that are working together on these issues. Um, so the Coastal Conservancy and many partners have been uh, working on pilot living shorelines for the past 10 years plus. And these projects have taken a lot of technical and um, regional interest, extra time by many engineers, ecologists, um, community groups, and construction contractors, permitters, et cetera. And this has really been done without a roadmap. Uh, the subtitle goals provides and other key documents that Jeremy shared provide large long-term regional goals but not a clear description of how to do it. And so these teams have really been at the forefront of developing first of their kind projects on the West Coast and in San Francisco Bay. They are based on co-equal goals of shoreline protection and habitat restoration. It's really strategic siting of habitat that then is meant to result in physical changes like wave attenuation benefits, sediment accretion, as well as habitat enhancement and better species recovery. There are many different types of approaches and we look forward, Jeremy shared the 10 that is a starting focus for this project, but we welcome hearing from you during this meeting and, and throughout about the types of combinations and green and gray measures that you're thinking about at sites. There are a lot of challenges, you know, we call them barriers, but they're just frankly challenges because uh, we don't have a, a long history of design practice here on the West Coast, um, permitting standards and guidance that's specific to this topic, and then construction contractors and engineers who are familiar with developing these types of green gray and ecologically focused designs. And so this has been first of its kind work. Uh, it's really important to test this in many locations. Uh, one size, of course, does not fit all. Each site is so unique in terms of its wave direction, wind, ener wind energy, landowners, community groups, and particular considerations that influence the, the uses of that site and the public perceptions of that site. And so it has been really important to work as a region to develop common best practices, but also not overly generally apply those to every site because they're so unique. And we're really interested in encouraging more sites and more monitoring so that we can continue to demonstrate this proof of concept. Um, you know, on the East and Gulf Coast, there's been a longer body of practice. And states like Maryland have their own Living Shorelines Protection Act that require entities, you know, prove that a living shoreline wouldn't work before getting a permit to install gray, gray infrastructure. We're not there yet, but there are many models around the country to look towards and incentivize this type of work to incorporate nature-based adaptation along with seawalls and gray infrastructure that will certainly be needed in many areas. But where we can, we would like to demonstrate nature-based adaptation and be able to scale that up more quickly. Uh, these pilot projects are small in size and with the urgency with sea level rise and climate change, we need those projects to have time to grow and learn from, and we need to scale up if we're really going to be able to address and adapt to sea level rise. Next slide, please. So this project was really developed to help with that scaling up and help expand the net of people engaged in this work. I think, you know, many partners that Jeremy called out, you know, San Francisco State and Smithsonian and, and many others who've contributed to these. There's just an incredibly proud body of practice the last 10 years. But if we can take that work and implement it and expand it in the next 10 years, we're really going to see an order of magnitude better level of change. So our goal is to develop a regional coalition of practitioners and landowners to increase awareness and involvement in and implementation of these multi-benefit living shorelines projects. We don't want to continue to work site by site and have to reinvent the wheel for any city staff or county staff that is new to this idea. We hope to work across jurisdictions and increase collaboration and knowledge transfer. 
um, so that lessons learned can be incorporated and we can iteratively build this body of practice. And this is really, we're taking a step to build upon at least five pilot projects that the Coastal Conservancy has been the lead on with many partners and the lessons learned that have been generated from highly intensive frequent monitoring of those projects between 2012 to 2023, and many lessons learned and data that can inform and have informed the continuing subsequent projects. Um, but we'll be doing this by assembling the first ever regional design and constructability guidance for living shorelines in San Francisco Bay. And that's with a group of about 15 experts who've been engaged in pilot projects to date. We're very excited about that so we can transfer knowledge and also use that to information for a second part of this project, which is working with a coalition of landowners we've identified in the Bay to develop 10 future living shoreline site designs and continue to build upon the successes and lessons learned. And lastly, we hope to reduce regulatory burdens by site and develop a more programmatic approach to apply consistent best methods, construction practices, monitoring requirements. And so I think part of this is helping to increase the information sharing and education with practitioners. Many groups are unaware of what agencies need to provide permits, what their requirements are, how to navigate the process. And we would all love to share our experiences so that others can learn from that and then work with uh, entities like the BRIT and the permitting agencies to utilize new programmatic permits that exist and develop new instruments if necessary. Next slide. So I just briefly want to talk about the Regionally Advancing Living Shorelines Project and the main tasks. Uh, the project is helping to complete and gather uh, project monitoring data at five pilot sites, and I'll show a map next of where those sites are. And the, that data and those lessons learned are being directly incorporated into the development of regional design and constructability guidance. This will be at a high level. It won't be like Society of Civil Engineers level of guidance, and it won't be enough for an entity to know everything they need to do at a site, but it will be a great set of common definitions, best practices, lessons learned, and best guidance to date that have been developed from the entities working on pilots. And then we're also planning SFEI and partners to collect new baseline monitoring data for these 10 new sites that have been identified. So instead of each entity at each site collecting bathymetry or drone surveys or site scan sonar surveys, we'll do that programmatically and then share data as a group and be able to discuss. This today, we're so excited for the first meeting for the Living Shorelines Collaborative. That's a key task that SFEI is helping to manage so that we can increase this information sharing, make all of this data available to others in the region and welcome learning from you about your projects and interests and data. And then the next phase will be to develop 30 to 60 percent designs for these 10 new sites, a programmatic sequinipa approach, and then a programmatic permit framework and applications for the 10 sites so that we can permit them as a suite instead of site by site. And lastly, there'll be a focus on community outreach, contractor trainings, workforce development that we're happy to talk about more in our next collaborative meetings. Next slide. This is a timeline of those tasks that I was just mentioning. So up top, you can see that right now in 24 and through the early 25, we're focused on completing this pilot site data collection, summary of monitoring from pilot projects and then focused heavily on developing of the guidance, which will be ready late 2025, early 26. But a lot of that data and information will be available to influence projects before then, before the final website and, and document are done. Um, the collaborative we're excited about having quarterly meetings over the next two years. And then the site design for those 10 sites and the programmatic permit preparation will be in the next phase starting early next year through 26. Um, community input, training and outreach will be throughout. And then the future construction is planned for more like 2027, 28. Some of those sites may have a chance to come in sooner if they have uh, smaller scale designs or simpler permitting. 
But for the most part, that's an effort that we'll fundraise for to do that construction in partnership with the coalition of landowners who, who are participating. Next slide. So just briefly, the funding that's been raised, we're so grateful to the funding partners, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, US EPA, SF Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund, and also the State Coastal Conservancy have contributed about 6.5 million for this effort. And that encompasses all of the tasks that we just briefly went through. And then for that future implementation phase, we do anticipate uh, seeking to fundraise about $30 million with the landowning partners to support the construction of those 10 sites, with obviously a very lead role by the landowners in project implementation. Next slide, please. So this map shows quite a lot of information at once. We're gonna kind of separate it out, but the sites in purple, especially up in the north there, are part of our five pilot sites that have been already constructed and monitoring and are helping to inform guidance. Um, there are 10 new living shoreline sites in green, which I'll talk about in a little in another slide in just a sec. And then we are looking to build out this map with all of you to list more collaborative partner sites where we can share information and transfer knowledge together. Next slide, please. So those five existing pilot sites, the San Rafael Living Shoreline site, um, which also was constructed the same year as the Eden Landing pilot site, um, Giant Marsh Living Shorelines up near Point Pinole, Terminal 4 Wharf Removal, which I'll talk about a little later, and then also the Red Rocks pilot site with City of Richmond. So those are the five, but there are additional sites. We'd love to get your pilot sites on the map so that we're aware of projects that can help to inform the guidance. Next slide, please. And then this is a short list of the 10 new project sites. Um, this is all a big mouthful. I hope we're not throwing too much information at you at once, but there are three sites in San Francisco. Um, several in collaboration with the Port of San Francisco, we're looking to establish an additional living seawall pilot site, expand the Pier 94 restoration, and expand looking at eelgrass opportunities and others with the Heron's Head restoration. Up in Marin, there are three sites, expanding our own San Rafael living shoreline site, um, looking at the Corte Madera Marsh Ecological Reserve and some marsh scarp erosion out there. And then also the Estuary and Ocean Science Center in Tiburon, there are exciting opportunities for habitat treatments. And then in the East Bay, there are four sites from the north, that's Point Isabel shoreline, uh, the Berkeley North Basin, Emeryville Crescent, and then the Hayward Cogswell Marsh region. Next slide. So for our project roles that we've mentioned that the Coastal Conservancy and SFEI are the leads on this project, but we cannot do this alone. All of these projects have developed and depended on partnerships. There are 15 regional experts. We have a slide next. We'll call those folks out who are engineers, ecologists, and other experts helping to develop the guidance and also working on the existing pilot site monitoring. We've engaged landowners and land managers for all of those sites we showed. And then there will be lead grantees such as Golden Gate Bird Alliance, Marin Audubon Society and others who we hope will sub to the regional design teams who will work collaboratively for these 10 site designs. And then of course we'll involve and look forward to involving additional content experts and creating connections so that we can share information as a region. Next slide please. So these are some of the key staff. I really wanna call out both the lead staff as well as our core design group, Kathy, uh, Kathy Boyer, who's not here today, but it's been really important. Sheila Zabin with Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, Keith Merkel, Peter Bay, Dan Gillenwater, Chris Barton and Scott Stoller from East Bay Regional Park District, Roger Leventhal, Julie Beagle, Jeannie Hammond, Diana Benner, Mark Cederborg, Michelle Orend, Eddie DeVita, and Renee Spence and Steve Carroll. So we're really grateful to these folks who've been meeting diligently and working already on the early design guidance. Next slide. 
So lastly, I just want to kind of acknowledge that we may have collaborative fatigue. There's a lot of collaboration going on, which is fantastic. I just wanted to kind of maybe show how this collaborative is, is unique for Living Shorelines. It's focused on Living Shorelines projects, which are achieving physical and biological goals. It's really focused on intertidal and subtidal habitats at the shoreline and near shore edge and green and green gray approaches. This will really focus on technical guidance to speed up implementation, permitting education with ourselves and our partners, as well as programmatic permitting with the agencies, and then workforce development and community training. So that's what's unique about this collaborative. 